do that. I'm going to be like speed, speedy Spadowski here. Okay. But, man, we're touching on a really important subject. I'm just going to tell you all my thoughts. All my thoughts are, I don't know what to think about everything I'm going to say this morning. So, we're going to learn together. We're going to read the Bible together. We're going to see some obvious stuff. And, um, yeah. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. Okay. Door or wall? Check out this passage. We're in Song of Solomon. This is how to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and our strength. The brothers are talking. Look on the left side first. It's the same passage from two different translations. The left side says, We have a little sister, too young to have breasts. What will we do for our sister if someone asks to marry her? If she is a virgin, like a wall, we will protect her with a silver tower. But if she is promiscuous, like a swinging door, we will block her door with a cedar bar. She replies, I was a virgin, like a wall. Now my breasts are like towers. When my lover looks at me, he is delighted with what he sees. Okay? Let's look at the one on the right side. It's a little more plain. It doesn't have some of the explanations that the NLT has. We have a little sister. She has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she's a wall, we'll build a battlement on her, a battlement of silver. But if she's a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. I was a wall. My breasts were like towers, and I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. Okay. Where are you going to go with that one, right? <laughs> um, I kind of knew this day was coming. And we're going we're gonna to talk about it. Are. But uh, you'll see where we're going with this. It's going to actually be pretty, pretty cool, I think. Yeah. So let's just talk about what we've read here so far. We've got these brothers. So it's a poem, right? It's an eight-chapter poem. It's a poem between a lover and a beloved. And there's all kinds of like enjoyment of each other and expressions of the challenges along the way. And, and it's a beautiful thing. And then we see in Paul's interpretation, he's like, man, whenever you talk about marriage, you're not talking about marriage between a man and a woman. You're talking about marriage between Christ and his church. So we're meant to understand the love relationship between God and us from the teachings of marriage things. Here's Song of Solomon, eight great chapters to learn a whole bunch of stuff. And in the middle of, or right at the end of it, we have this passage. Here we have the poem, the brothers get to speak. And they express, hey, here's our little sister. She better be a wall where there's no getting in or out. You know, like, fortified. Nobody's getting in. But if she's a door, then we're going to protect her. We're going to, like, block her in. We're going to protect her from getting out and being a hussy. Okay? And she replies, no, no, this is in the context of her new marriage and everything with Solomon. I was a wall. First cow on the right. I was a wall. My breasts were like towers. Then I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. So she said, I grew up and I did good. So, thank you. <laughs> good job, brothers. I release you from your obligation to protect me. Okay? So that's, that's our story here. Um, what we have, though, in the very fact that this is even spoken of, is we have a very important, obvious teaching, right? Um, um, don't be a hussy, I guess. That would be one. But remember, this is not just man and woman. This is Christ and the church. So we're going to talk about that dynamic mostly this morning. But let's just take the obvious kind of earthly, natural direction. Um, you know, in this kind of a crowd, we know that virginity is preferred to promiscuity. Right? Everyone's going to probably hope to give me a head nod. Yeah. Virginity to promiscuity. Yeah, Matt. Uh, so that's, that's not just a cultural thing among Christians, like that is, I think it's a safe teaching just to hang our hat on. Um, so let's just cover that one real quick because it's in front of us. Check out 1 Corinthians 6. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? 
Should, so should I take a part of Christ's body and make it a part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For scripture says the two will become one flesh. But anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run from sexual immorality. Every sin a person can commit is outside the body. On the contrary, the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought by Christ. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Um, we could spend a lot of time talking about this one. That's not actually where we're going to spend most of our time. If, if, if this is a passage that's twinging on anyone's brain, it's 1 Corinthians 6. Go back and study it. Uh, but we, we have another objective, and I hate to breeze past it, but like I said, this could be three hours today, so that's one reason why we're cutting off two hours right there, right? Here's the big one, my friends. Um, virginity lasts until marriage in the ideal scenario, okay? And then intimacy breaks that bound. For you and I, when is the wedding to Jesus Christ? The simple answer is you got this. There's, the there's going to be a wedding feast in heaven, and we're going to be married to the Lord when we meet him face to face. Yeah, so we've got our Revelation 19 that keeps popping up. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has prepared herself. The marriage of the Lamb has come. This is Revelation 19. This is at the end of the age. When is our wedding, our marriage to the Lamb? It's at the end of the age. Okay, let's, let's just, and I'm not, you know, I'm just saying, let's just compare. Suppose we say, well, we're married to Jesus already. How was the ceremony? Tell me about the reception. <laughs> you think you marry God and it's just a, a, a metaphorical thing? Like, no, he's going to have a party of cosmic proportions. So the wedding, this is, this is, see, see where we're going here? The wedding for you and I is still in the future. So maintaining our purity unto the Lord is still a priority. Okay, some of you are young, some of you are old. Those of you who are old, remember how hard it was to wait for being married? Right? Like, just the whole package. Like, who are you going to marry, and how are you going to find them, and... The whole tension involved and everything like that. Um, was it easy or hard? Come on, old people, help me out. I don't really remember. It was hard, wasn't it? Okay. I'm not old, but it's hard. Yeah, hey, man. I've got you a lot. It's tough. I know you. <laughs> okay. So along the way, in the difficulty, there's opportunity to not wait around. And so a person has to make decisions about the waiting around or the not to wait around. To not wait, we call that promiscuity. We call that sexual immorality. That's what the Bible terms it. To wait around preserves virginity, purity. We're all on the same page here? This is, this is basic stuff, right? But here we are, when is our wedding? It's in the future. So are there temptations and challenges in our relationship to Jesus in being faithful to Him? Are there temptations and challenges that we experience right now? Isn't that interesting? We want to study some of this. We want to look at some of this. And uh, there's no way we're going to be able to cover everything today. But I want to, I want to get this idea in our heads and thinking about it. Um, because we, we want to grab from this a very important lesson that I can be tempted away from purity and simplicity of devotion to Jesus. Because my wedding is not yet. <laughs> so, let's, let's start looking at that. In the Bible, harlotry is a picture of unfaithfulness. Okay, it's simple, right? But it gets used 
spiritually. The Jewish people were said to have committed harlotry with the Lord. How, how, how does a whole nation commit harlotry with the Lord? We're not going to get into that part of the study. We're going to look at some of the obvious stuff. But it centers around what the Bible pictures as Babylon. Let's review the Babylon story, okay? The Babylon story, um, the Jews were already running wild. Ezekiel 16. Uh, they're running wild. They're worshiping every god. They're eating their raisin cakes and uh, having ceremonies under every spreading tree and everything. And the Lord says, you guys are, are committing harlotry with me. So what he does is he sends Assyria, conquers the northern tribes, sends Babylon and exiles them to Babylon. And then they're there and they don't have access to the temple. They don't have access to the worship of God in, in, the, in the formal way that they have. And it is another time now where they have to make another decision. Do I forget my God that I would normally worship way over in Israel and start living a life of Babylon? So Babylon becomes this picture of the home for all wickedness. And if we go through the prophets, we will see that they'll continue to refer to like this Babylon as being a place that can continually be the source of all wickedness for God's people. And it becomes now uh, a symbol. So Babylon becomes a symbol for unfaithfulness to the Lord. When we fast forward, remember the, the wedding is mentioned in Revelation 19, which begins that that close-out section of the book of Revelation as we get into all the really cool stuff. And Jesus comes with the sword of his mouth and kills everybody in Armageddon and, and sets up his kingdom, and it's just awesome after that, right? The devil gets put in the bottomless pit. Well, up to that point, you know, there's lots of things going on in Revelation. But in two chapters, not one, but two chapters, 10% of the book of Revelation is this teaching on the harlot of Babylon. Look at this. Let's read this together. We're going to do a little bit of reading so we can put some of these pieces together, okay? Revelation 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me. Come, I will show you the judgment of the notorious prostitute who sits on many waters. The kings of the earth committed sexual immorality with her, and those who live on the earth became drunk on the wine of her sexual immorality. So he carried me away in the spirit to a desert. <coughs> I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She had a gold cup in her hand, filled with everything vile and the impurities of her prostitution. On her forehead, a cryptic name was written, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the vile things of the earth. Then I saw that the woman was drunk on the blood of the saints and on the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. Just pause a second to review what we've got. He sees this sim symbolic imagery, but it's this woman. She is named on her head. She is Babylon the Great. And what is she? She's not just a prostitute. She is the mother of prostitutes. She produces little babies that grow up and lead people into termed sexual immorality. But is it is it true physical, natural immorality that's being talked about here? No, this is the leading away of intimacy from the Lord and into the vile things, the impurities of prostitution. This is spiritual that's being talked about. Our spirits being taken away from simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus and into whatever she can produce. She is the mother of all the vile things <laughs> that are of the earth. Do you think it's a coincidence that right after this is spoken of the marriage to Jesus? A prostitute gets spoken about, and then a pure bride gets married? Do you think that's a biblical coincidence? God's showing us that there is a comparison that we need to make. You can be with either one. <laughs> <laughs> you can be with either one. Now, let's read something about the judgment, okay? So Revelation 17 carries on for a while, talks about her that she's going to get judged, so here comes the judgment in Revelation 18. After this, I saw another angel with great authority coming down from heaven, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. It's a big angel. 
He cried in a mighty voice. It has fallen, Babylon the Great. She has become a dwelling for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, and a haunt for every unclean and despicable beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. The kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown wealthy from her excessive luxury. Then I heard another voice from heaven. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins or receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. All this will happen because your merchants were the nobility of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by her sorcery, and the blood of the prophets and saints, and all those slaughtered on earth was found in you. Okay, so here comes the judgment. And it's for reasons, okay? So let's look at those reasons. So we got these crimes. What are her crimes? Revelation 17, oh, I didn't put the verse. Whoops, anyway. She had a gold cup in her hand, and it was filled with everything vile. So here we've got the source, maybe not the source, source, but she was the mother of, right? Everything vile and the impurities of her prostitution. Her other crimes were the nobility of the earth, the merchants of the earth, and all the nations were deceived by her. <coughs> her sorcery. This is interesting. She had some sort of a, we could use the word spell, but like she created some sort of a misleading package deal that not just the merchants, but look at that, the nations. And we know that from 17, she's sitting on many waters. That's all the people of the earth. So all the people of the earth are carried along by her deceptive, we call it a sorcery, but like she's just, she creates this sort of like magnetic something that they all went along with. And then she's also the place where the prophets and the saints get slaughtered. Well, that's interesting. Just randomly killed? Maybe. Let's talk, take a look at another question on this. How can we commit sexual immorality with her and thus participate in her crimes? Because that was what was said, right? Come out of her, my people, so that you don't share in her sins or receive of her plagues, because her sins are piled to heaven. God has remembered her crimes. Okay, so um, this idea of glorifying herself and living luxuriously, is that a crime to live in a little bit of luxury? <laughs> I have a comfortable couch. Is that a crime? Right. But there's this idea, she glorified herself, she lived luxuriously. What does that idea mean? She lived luxuriously. You know, there is this terrible phrase where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's not automatic. It's when the rich oppress the poor <laughs> and rob from them. Okay? Man, this is a really practical Sunday. I don't know if you guys realize yet. How, I hope you guys realize how practical this Sunday is going to be. We'll get to it before we're done. This idea of glorifying self, okay? We don't want to participate in that. We want to glorify God. We don't want to glorify this, this uh, I'm going to use the word system, but like all the merchants, all the kings, all the people have been caught up in this prostitution, uh, this, this vile spell that she has offered everyone and they're all deceived by it. So we can participate with her in joining in her glory she lives luxuriously, presumably, on the backs of those who aren't living luxuriously. Let's look at 11. The merchants of the earth will also weep and mourn over her because no one buys their merchandise any longer. Okay, what does Babylon buy? What does Babylon deal in? Gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine fabrics of linen, purple, silk, scarlet, all kinds of fragrant wood products, ivory, expensive wood, brass, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine wheat flour and grain, cattle, sheep, horses, carriages, slaves, and human lives? Except for slaves and human lives. Is anything in there evil? Okay. Okay. So, what about this one? This is the very next verse. The fruit you crave has left Can we worship this stuff? Can, can this stuff become so important to us that we would fight to keep it? 
We call that a first world lifestyle, don't we? <laughs> Nobody's supposed to take away my right to gold, silver, stones, wood products, oil, wheat, flour, grain, cattle, sheep, horses, oh, and slaves and human lives. We can become hooked on the products of this world. And if Babylon is the one dealing in it, then they become the owner to us, the slave. All the splendid and glamorous things are gone. <coughs> After the judgment, you'll never find them again. Okay, now in the biblical picture, Babylon produces products. Because products touch a little thing in us, don't they? You ever watch TV and just want to buy that thing? Okay. Who here has got the as seen on TV stuff filling the garage? Um, so products, they can, they can become like a heart idol. But what about all of the media stuff? What about all of it? Can that become a product that Babylon produces? Does Babylon produce anything that comes across your television? <laughs> this could really quick turn into a pulpit pounding, don't watch TV thing, right? So we're not quite going to go there, okay? Or kind of. I'm going to throw something at you here before too long. So we, we, it's deceptive, isn't it? Remember, 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 remember. The nations were deceived by her sorcery. Guys, remember that? No, Matt, I'm not hooked on anything from Babylon. I'm completely clean. Ah, that's the point. There's a deception in there. Are we really? Okay. Sherry and I were up late talking the last couple nights about this because this is one of those things that I just... We're going to get to it right away. How can we recognize Babylon? There's a vile pollution. Is there anything vile that this system is promoting? Can you think of anything vile that our system is currently promoting? <laughs> Those of you who are watching the news, can you think of anything vile that the Babylonian system is promoting? Transgender, LGBT, washroom. It's about to get heavy. Whole package deal. Or even something that I was struck by this morning, just the idea in school, like we teach our kids, you can do whatever you want, you can be whatever you want, mm -hmm. when really our plans are supposed to be directed by the Lord. Like that's a Babylonian theory. Yeah, the, it opens the worship of self. Yeah. We can recognize Babylon from its vileness, we can recognize it by universal acceptance because. The waters you saw where the prostitute is seated are the peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. My friends, if everybody is saying it, I think we should question it. Um, all the nations were deceived. What about the death of the saints? Now, right now, at this exact moment, there aren't Christians being killed in North America over these things. Not yet, but I'm going to drop a couple of bombshells on you guys. Okay, because the blood of the prophets and the saints and all those slaughtered on the earth was found in you. Okay, the obvious signs versus the tricky signs. Now, I'm just, like I said, we could turn this into a pulpit pounding thing, and I'm not quite going there, but you guys remember Brady Bunch and Leave It to Beaver. Okay? Evil. Leave it to Beaver. That child would talk back to his mother, and she would punish him, and he would accept the punishment. And that was on television. Not so evil, right? What happened 50 years later to TV? You guys know what TV show I'm talking about? No. no. Really? Am I more into culture? I'm sorry. Breaking Bad. <laughs> yeah, Breaking Bad, yeah. Very. Way to go, Sandra. You're so in tune. <laughs> you don't know who I heard it from. But... I don't know. Nobody related to you. No. <laughs> Now the hero is someone who engages in vile pollution in order to do good things, justifying and justifying the means. Okay? Did you know that you can turn on to a variety of child television stations and you can read and watch all about the 11-year-old romances that are happening in the local school? It's, it's, a, mini, it's a mini soap opera. It, thank you, head nod. You don't get any of that in your house. No way. Hey, <laughs> Okay, yeah, you're watching like little kids. Like there's 11 and 12 year old actors and they're, she can wander around, it's fine. Just don't bang on the drum. Um, 
talking about, you know, they're, who they're dating and how they're not getting along and they're going to break up with this person and go to that person. Oh, it's disgusting. Isn't it? Someone else? Help me out. Okay, are you ready for the bombshell? I'm not going to hit it yet, but I'm going to open it up. What about neutral television or movies that fund immoral agendas? Does that happen? Does that happen? Are there... You know what? I better say no to that one, because that's got... <laughs> what movies have you been watching? <laughs> oh, that one? Oh, okay. oh, for the record, last week I stated, Rachel, that if the babies come, you should pick them up and enjoy them. And that way we're not like creating this babies are bad motif. Okay. okay. Um, babies aren't bad, okay? Yeah, certainly not. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm just gonna can I just tell you my honest heart. Yeah. I don't even know if this is gonna end up on the internet yet. Okay. <laughs> I really want to see Iron Man and Captain America kick Brandless's butt. Okay, and it's gonna happen in 2019 with Infinity Wars one and two, and I'm looking forward to that. I really am. <laughs> but doggone it. I'm just telling you where I'm at. I'm just, we're just being honest, right? Okay, we're just being honest. Did you guys know, like, that Disney took my 12 bucks and, and then they blackmailed Georgia against the Religious Freedom Bill a month and a half ago? <laughs> a month and a half ago, there was a bill that was presented to the governor of Georgia. It went sweeping through their, their political system. So the people of Georgia spoke. We want to make sure that Christians don't get punished for having Christian beliefs. And, and it was actually very carefully worded. It was tactfully worded. And it was just protecting what seems to be obvious under the Constitution, but they just wanted to state it. Okay? Disney hears about it. If you sign that bill, Governor, we will take our business elsewhere. Is that blackmail? Is that extortion? Where did they get the money to blackmail the governor of Georgia with? People like you. Oh, I was so upset when I put it together. <laughs> Isn't that sad? Because I want to see what happens to Thranos. I do. So it's neutral, right? It's kind of neutral. It's reasonably neutral movies, reasonable neutral content. And then they take that money and they fund a Babylonian agenda. And they say, Governor, if you're not on board with the Babylonian agenda, you are out of our economy. True or false? True or false? If you don't sign on to what we say is right, good, pure, true, but it's vile, polluted, evil, if you don't, then you're out of our economy. And the NFL did it, and Coca-Cola. So now you can't drink Coke. <laughs> like I said, I'm just, I'm working through this stuff. I'm messing with this stuff, I'm messing with my head. Because this stuff is real. Is this real? This is really, really, really real. Does anyone else think we're close to the end times? We're gonna have to get more and more real about how real it is, and get our head out of some sandboxes about some of that stuff. <laughs> well, what's even worse than that is the fact that uh, the Charter of Rights was brought in supposedly to give support Christians and all, you know, uh, gen it sounded good that it was going to support the Canadian uh, people. And, uh, but guess what? The, uh, it doesn't do it, and the courts are, uh, are going against it. The courts the are, are moving against Christianity in, in, in Canada. Canada. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, what do these words mean? Nothing. You know, what do these charters mean? Huh? Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a war of definitions. You change your definition of what a human is, you can have abortions. You change your definition of what a human is, you can have the transgender thing. If you have the definitions of what rights are, you just keep changing definitions. Okay. It's a real war. So what happens if we don't side with the agenda? Okay, are we, how far away from this are we? How far away? I don't know. How far away? What happens if we don't side with this agenda? What, what happens? 
So, um, I, didn't, I didn't put this on there, but after I read that article um, about Disney uh, extorting the state of Georgia and Cave, there was at the bottom this little comment. Many people think Christians are jerks. Maybe we should just stop hiring them for anything. March 29th. So, so that's not some leader. That's just a grassroots person saying, maybe we should stop hiring Christians. <laughs> What's it going to cost to oppose Babylon? What's it going to cost? What's it going to cost? It's going to take Donald Trump. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Fortunately, it's going to take more than Donald Trump. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a lot of hope, honestly, but my hope is I swear. <laughs> Here we go. Our right to participate in the economy depends on our allegiance to the agenda. According to Revelation 18, to participate in the sins of the economy agenda is the same as sexual immorality with the prostitute Babylon. We're still talking about the subject of of having a purity and simplicity of devotion to Christ and not participating in immorality in the world. Okay, just put that up there, that's there. That really happened, it's a real headline. March 29, I think that one was, 26. Okay, Jesus has a plan, okay? Revelation 19 says, verse 1, after this I heard something like the loud voice, well this is after the judging and smashing of Babylon announced in 1718. Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and right. Just because he has judged the notorious prostitute who corrupted the earth with her sexual immorality. And he has avenged the blood of his slaves that was on her hands. His servants stand for purity and simplicity of devotion to him. They stand against the corruption of the earth that's in because of the notorious prostitute and her immorality. They are often killed in this flow of teaching. They are often killed, but God comes back with judgments that are righteous and true and judges this prostitute. Okay, sideline. Sideline, 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 sideline coming. Revelation 17, verse 16 is extremely clear. This is not where we're going today, but we're talking about it, so we have to bring this in. Extremely accurate about how God judges the Babylonian system. And I'm going to blow your brains right now, so hold on. The ten horns you saw and the beast will hate who? Who's the beast? Who's the beast? More specifically, the Antichrist, right? You guys know that from Revelation interpretation? Yeah. The beast is the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. The ten horns you saw and the beast will hate the prostitute. What? I thought the Antichrist was in league with the whole nation and all the world and everything. Okay? The Antichrist will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked, devour her flesh, and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out His plan by having one purpose, and to give their kingdom to the beast until God's words are accomplished. How does God judge the Babylonian system with the Antichrist. Thought you'd want to know. Is that the Muslim? Not a study of Revelation today. <laughs> All right. So, stay on point, preserving our virginity with Jesus. Right after, look on the left side, he's going to judge this prostitute, and then he says, right away, right side, uh, something like a vast multitude, the sound of cascading waters and rumbling thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, begin to reign, let us be glad, rejoice, give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has prepared herself. She's been given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. God judges the prostitute and everybody who partook in her sins. And then he has a wedding with the pure bride. Okay. 
So our clothing, some of our righteous acts, are going to be to stand against the agenda of Babylon and not participate in her sins. That will comprise some of the saints' acts, right? To not participate in her sins because her crimes are piled to heaven. Some of our righteous acts will be to not accept the pleasure of Babylon and not enjoy its money-making trickery. Right? That's the, the deception of the sorcery that this Babylonian spirit puts on the world and we become so in entwined with it that now it controls us, it directs us, it manipulates us. So some of these good pleasures might have to be foregone in order to not have them have authority over us so that we don't participate in their sin. Everyone kind of following that line of thought there? It's interesting, isn't it? And this is where, like, I can't sit here and offer super specifics on, you know, I know I, I threw Disney up on there, but, I mean, I can't. I can't offer specifics on what exactly each individual here should do or what we should be doing and not be doing. Because the truth is, this is why I was wrestling with Sherry about it. Not wrestling with Sherry because she was fighting me on it. We're just, we're just talking out loud. I mean, Walmart does terrible stuff. Do you guys know that? Terrible stuff. They price control their suppliers until they go out of business and then go find another one. How would you like your job to depend on a buyer who tells you how much you can, that, how much they're going to buy that widget? Walmart says, I'm going to buy that widget for $5, but it takes me $7 to produce it. Your problem. I'll find someone else who can. You guys ever heard of fair trade coffee? Yes. You know why there's fair trade coffee? Because there's unfair trade coffee. <laughs> Pricing local coffee growers out of a lifestyle, making them slaves to the corporation. Anyway, like I said, we're part of a system right now that is so corrupt <laughs> that it's kind of too big to fathom, and we're going to need God's help to sort through it all. I'm not starting some revolution right now. I'm just expressing the challenges in front of me. Okay, everybody take a deep breath. Everybody okay? Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so what we're going to do here, I'm just going to wrap up with one important point based on our original passage. Okay, we don't obviously want to be involved in the immorality of the Babylonian spirit. But you know, waiting and growing up marks the bride of Christ. God isn't going to marry a young girl. Christ is waiting to marry a mature bride. Christ isn't going to marry a swinging door. He's going to marry a bride, Ephesians 5, without spot or blemish. So we have time. We have time. We have time. We have time to sort out our connections to Babylon. We have time to like, have the Holy Spirit guide us into purity and simplicity of devotion to Christ. It will mature us. It will grow us up. Because that was what the passage was. We have a, a young sister, and then she grows up and says, actually, now I'm old. Now I'm old, and now I can be married. We have time to grow up. And so she'll be known, she'll be, she will be showing that she loves him by waiting for him through the challenges of the sexual immorality of her day. She will prove her maturity and restraint by not participating in the tempting deeds of Babylon, knowing that the satisfying love of the Lamb is just around the bend of time. Isn't that what it means to preserve our virginity? Just wait. Just wait. Say no. Say no. Say no. Say no. Say no. And just wait. Be content. Not give in to the temptations that want to draw us away from waiting. And, and it grows us up, it matures us, and we become an older, mature bride. We're not a, a swinging door world wall. We stayed firm in our purity and simplicity of devotion to Jesus. Over the time, it grew us up. And then God marries us, and it's beautiful. Okay, I'm just going to throw a few questions out here, and then we're done. Man, what an intense Sunday. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry, but you know what I mean. Like, But I just want to throw a few at you, okay? Just because I don't want to end on a light note. <laughs> What's the role, and I do just general questions, what is the role of pleasure and entertainment in my life? Why is that a good question? Because if I'm hooked on pleasure and entertainment and Babylon produces most of it, I am now a sucker for what they produce. 
So if pleasure and entertainment are central to my life, then I want to be pleased and entertained, and Babylon is more than happy to give me all the fine goods that I want to enjoy. Just a question. Is pleasure and entertainment a right? I have a right to five hours of TV. You know, I'm just picking numbers, right? I get tired when I come home from work, and the TV calms me down. Anyway, right? Do we have a right to these things? <laughs> okay. Just kind of challenging some of this stuff. Who am I allowing to please me? Do I know who I'm allowing to please and entertain me? Do I know them? Are they a trustworthy source? Are there alternate ways to be pleased and entertained? To what it's worth. Do I spend more time on Babylonian entertainment than on cultivating my relationship with God and others? Just a question. These are questions. I'm not kidding you. I am asking these questions myself, and now I'm making you feel the same pain I'm going through right now. Okay? So, join me. Right? Sherry, do I veg out on Monday? Yeah, definitely veg out. Okay. There's a bit of Netflix gets used on Monday. So, so I am asking this question myself. Because <laughs> it's winter, it's cold, I'm tired, and I'm exhausted, and I want to watch some Star Wars. <laughs> So stupid. Disney bought Star Wars. <laughs> I'm really not happy about that. Okay. Who satisfies me? The products of Babylonian culture? Or am I satisfied when I go on outings with my spouse to be Jesus? So good. Okay, another couple. Because let's switch to economy. Okay, we're off of that one. Switch to economy. Have I placed myself in debt or contract with those economic elements of the world which could ruin me if I needed to deny their agenda? Okay. Have I any areas of compromise or I have compromised in the past regarding symbolic sexual immorality or real sexual immorality? Have I compromised on this? Like, is God exposing areas right now in my heart? Like, hey man, I need you to deal with that. Because then I just need to receive God's forgiveness turn away from the things that are compromising, or am I holding on to them alongside my upcoming marriage to God? Okay, do I believe that I can hold on to the pleasures of Babylonian prostitution and be a wall for my Lord when He comes to marry me? Answer, according to Jesus, no. No. His bride is going to have without spot or blemish, Ephesians 5. There's time to do that. There's time for him to work out. What do you guys think? That for without Christ, I would not be righteous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. The grace of God covers all of this stuff, right? You guys feel that? It's like, what do you mean, Matt? You're plugging with TV? I thought Christian ministers, they shouldn't do that. Leave that one. I feel it. But it's, it's, it's messing with our rights. We have no rights if we're dead in Christ. Anyway, we're probably not done with this stuff, but the passage brought it up. Alright, here we go. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, man. Without Christ, there would be no righteousness, Lord. You are looking to do a work through your Holy Spirit in us to make us be ready for an age of ages. That's the phrase that you use. This age will pass. And it will be so, so back burner in our memories, we'll wonder why we ever thought it was important. And right now, with the Babylonian spirit running rampant in our world, it can seem to be a high price to cut ties with it, or whatever you're asking us to do, however that looks. 
But God, we, we, need, we need you, Holy Spirit, to guide us so that we're not just doing legalistic stuff if we feel like that's what we want to do. Or go around with a chainsaw and start cutting off the... But we need your wisdom. We need your input. We need your guidance. We do. We do. We ask for it. So that you would have a spirit of peace over us. Your spirit of peace creates a safe environment for us to be led into just what it is that you are asking of us in order to be that pure bride. Without that peace, we can um, we can become self-righteous. And we don't want to open a door to self-righteousness any more than we want to open a door to Babylon. <laughs> so, we really need help. God, we really we need help. We really need help. Uh, but, I'm just, I'm just thinking, God, I think time is getting short. I think time is getting short. So, God, we want to we look to you. We don't want to have a habit of looking anywhere but to you. So, God, just do a work right now in our hearts just to provide um, the courage we need to know what to do. And then, God, we just talked about that. If, we, if we're aware of any compromises in our physical immorality or in our spiritual immorality, Lord, we just want to turn away from those. We want to receive forgiveness. We want to come back to the Lord right now. It's not worth it. There is a judgment coming on immorality in this world that will make its head spin. Jesus has a robe dipped in blood. That does not mean that he took the edge of it and put it in a little pot of blood. He took the whole thing and he soaked a white robe in blood. And he gets on a horse and he comes with a sword in his mouth. He is not coming to joke or smile or laugh or play. He's coming for blood. So Jesus, we want to treat you with respect in that regard. Afterwards, you'll take that robe off and you'll put on a wedding robe. And it'll be a feast. So we want to be ready for both types of Jesus. But we don't want to be on the wrong side of the red robe to Jesus. So God, anyway, we open up our hearts, we open up our minds to you, Lord, for all these things. Thank you so much for being a wonderful guide. Thank you for drawing us into you again and again and again. We love you, Lord. Thank you for our gathering here together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody. Have a good day. Do you know the right way to fix an iPod touch that has been locked to so long that it can't download?